Before we begin, how many of you know what this is? It's called a thermometer. It measures the temperature. And they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There was a fellow draw, draw, driving along a desert highway when he stopped into a little store, and there happened to be an old man with a mule there standing next to him as he was sitting in a chair. The man said, man, it is hot today. I wonder how hot it is. And the man sitting in the chair turned, and he turned the mule's face to his. He stared at it for a second and said, it's 99 degrees. He goes, man, that's hot. He goes, but how in the world can you tell the temperature by looking at the mule's face? He said, no, you see that thermometer over there on the wall? That's how I did it. Well, James 4 is a thermometer. He's writing to the church. He's not writing to unbelievers. As a matter of fact, he will refer to his intended audience 19 times as brethren or beloved brethren. Moreover, the book of James is not written to demonstrate various tests of faith. In other words, if you're really a believer, you're going to look like this. If you're not a believer, you're going to look like this. Rather, James is writing to demonstrate the believer's vitality of faith. He doesn't question whether it exists. The question he wants to know is, how well are you growing in it? Some of us would say, well, I think I'm doing pretty well. James, therefore, puts this chapter in there in his argument and discussion in reference to how we can determine when a church, or more particularly members of the church, can be worldly-minded. And so today I've entitled the lesson, How Can a Christian Be Worldly-Minded? Now before we can answer the question, we really need to begin by asking, what does it mean to be worldly-minded? If I know I'm going to be one, maybe or maybe not, I need to know what that definition means. To be worldly-minded means to be devoted to worldly interest and the affairs of the present life. To have the desire, love, pursuit of this world's goods to the exclusion of religious affections or spiritual concerns. Just like the Toby Key song, right? It's all about me. That's what worldly-mindedness is. Now, James tells us that worldly-mindedness can manifest itself in the church in at least three different ways. And that's the way he breaks down the chapter. He says in verses 1 through 10 that worldly-mindedness is expressed in the church when one seeks self-gratification as the chief end or goal in life. In verses 11 and 12, he says that worldly-mindedness is expressed in the church when we are critical of other people. We see that in verses 11 and 12. And then finally in verses 13 through 17, worldly-mindedness is expressed in the church when we have an arrogant disregard of God's purposes. An arrogant disregard of God's purposes. So let's begin by looking at verses 1 through 10 in that we choose many times self-gratification as the primary objective in our lives. In other words, we become selfish. We, we seek pleasure as the chief end or goal in life. James will go on to tell us that this, that is, seeking pleasure for the sake of pleasure, is the source of all conflict in relationships. Look at what he says beginning at verse 1. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Again, he's writing to the church. He says, is not the source, here he tells us what the source is, your pleasures that wage war in your members. 
members, he's referring to the body. Now, the word pleasures comes from the Greek word hedone, uh, which where we get our English word hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure for the sake of pleasure. He says, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask, and the asking there is in the middle voice. In the Greek, it means uh, that the one who is fulfilling the action is also the recipient of the action. Uh, So what he's saying is, you ask for yourselves, and yet you don't receive. Why, would be the question. Well, James tells us, because you ask with wrong motives, reason, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Again, the word hedone. It's all about me, asking God for things. God, I want a new car. I want a new house. I want a new job. All of these things that we ask God. And it's not necessarily wrong that we ask God for things, but what James is concerned about is the motives. The motives. Because when we don't get our way, it is the source of all the conflicts in our relationship. Moreover, this selfish pleasure, seeking selfish pleasure, causes conflict in our relationship with God. Look at verse 4. He says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore... Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. As we read that, you might very well be asking, what what does that mean? What is James saying? How can God be jealous? Dr. Zane Hodges, in his commentary on James, writes, If God is jealous, His Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, is jealous. Thus, James is affirming that God's indwelling Spirit yearns jealously over the affections of His readers. He is therefore grieved by their pursuit of friendship with the world. The readers ought to take this most seriously, for the Scripture does not say such a thing lightly. In fact, the words in vain, coupled with the strong assertions about God's Spirit, hint at the possibility of some kind of retribution if the Spirit's yearning over them is ignored. You say, well, what would that look like? Well, we can, we can at least learn by way of analogy what that would look like. I mean, consider those of you who are married your spouse in your relationship with your spouse. Now let's say we have a married couple over here. Uh, The guy works at a place where there's uh, some females in the same area where he works at, and he begins to develop a friendship with one of the females that sometimes the wife thinks is a little suspicious because he seems to spend a lot of time talking on the phone. Uh, They go to eat lunch together. And then... As the wife begins to contemplate these things, she begins to realize that he's spending more time with her than with me, with the result that she's going to get angry. Why? Jealous. The fear of losing something that you have. And if it stays in operation too long, the husband may not like what happens. So we can understand the jealous type of relationship by looking at the human relationships between husbands and wives. God is jealous when we pursue adultery with the world by craving and seeking and pursuing this world's goods. He says, Therefore, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, the word opposed there comes from the Greek word antitasso, and it means to take your stand against or to fit yourself out in battle against. It's a military term. 
And, and we all understand what it means to suit up for war, right? Especially those of you who remember the movies in the 80s. We all remember Arnold Schwarzenegger, Chuck Norris, John Rambo, all those guys, you know, and they're getting ready in the big climactic scene. To, they're fitting themselves out for battle, putting a, a knife about that long in a sheath on the side. They're putting war paint on their face, camouflage. They're loading up an M60 that never seems to go out of ammo <laughs> because they're fitting themselves out to fight the enemy. That's the word that James uses when he says God resist and is opposed to the proud God fits himself out in battle gear against the proud but he gives grace to the humble and so selfish pleasure then is the source of conflict selfish pleasure for the sake of pursuing it causes conflict with God when James tells us that God requires humility and repentance. Look at what he says in verse 7. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That little verse gets overlooked in a lot of theology today, uh, particularly in charismatic circles where we see people talking about binding Satan, rebuking Satan, all of these other things. Sometimes I'd seen a class on, hey, you need to come tonight. We're going to teach you a class on how you can bind Satan and rebuke Satan. Do you realize that there's not one place in Scripture from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation chapter 22 where we're in any sense instructed to bind Satan or to rebuke Satan? James says here simply, resist the devil. That is, take your stand against the devil and he will flee from you. We need only to think about the Lord and his temptations. When three times Satan tells him, if you'll do this, you'll have it. And each time, Jesus didn't carry on a dialogue with Satan. He simply said, it is written. It is written. It is written. His responses became the written Word of God. That is, to doing God's will with the result that Satan left him. Satan is not afraid of our wise witticisms, but he is mastered by the Word of God. So resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. What's he saying here? He's saying, have a penitent heart. Realize that, that you're currently living your life going the wrong way on the freeway. Turn around and go the right way. And that you should see your sin the way that God sees your sin. That you should weep, that you should mourn, that you should repent. Humble yourselves, James writes, in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. He will exalt you. You don't have to worry about trying to exalt yourself to expand your influence over people and organizations. Simply humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt you in due season. So worldly mindedness, then, James tells us, expresses itself in the church through self-gratification. And then secondly, he tells us that it expresses itself in the way that we use our tongues and that we become critical of other people. Now, what he's referring to here is being critical of, their, of other people in non-moral areas. Remember, he's writing to the church about how we interrelate with one another in the church. So it's real easy, unless uh, you know, someone is doing something that violates the moral, moral will of God, it's easy to go and, and confront the person and say, Hey, brother, hey, sister. I'm looking at your life, and you're walking this way. You know, the Word of God says we shouldn't do that. Don't make this choice. Make this choice. This is what God wants us to do. That's relatively easy to do. 
the problem comes in when we, we try to deal with other believers based upon issues of personal preference. And a lot of times these things come with us like baggage, particularly those of you who maybe came out of a uh, somewhat old school fundamental background, whether you be a part of the charismatic slash Pentecostal movement or being a part of, for example, of the fundamentalist Baptist positions. You remember these or they who probably in the 60s and 70s, you know, couldn't go to the movies. You can't play cards, right? You can't mow your grass on Sunday. And God forbid if you get caught with a rod and reel in your hand on a Sunday morning, right? Those of you who have been in that type of an environment realize that that's something that was a real issue. What James is saying here is don't be critical of other people in areas where God makes no specific command for or against. In other words, don't try to put a burden on other people based upon your own personal preference and prejudice. And that's one of the things that we see a lot today. We are judgmental, are critical of our Christian brothers and sisters in non-moral areas. Notice what James says in verse 11. He says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So let me ask you a question. Why are people often critical of other people? Why do we get caught criticizing other people, particularly when it's a non-moral issue? Well, one of the reasons is that it's normally quite easier to criticize, to judge or assess other people than it is to deal with our own issues. In fact, speaking negatively about other people and non-moral issues tends to give one the feeling that he or she and their problems are really insignificant by comparison. That's why people like to talk about other people. Yeah, I know I've got problems, but I'm not like this guy, or I'm not like this gal. And so what are they doing? They're comparing themselves to another in order to elevate themselves. When in fact, if we're going to compare ourselves to something, we need to compare ourselves to God's perfect standard. Because we'll soon realize that none of us measure up. The one who is critical self-righteously points out the speck in the other Christian's eye through their own subjective standard. But in doing so, has failed to remove the plank in his own eye, he or she f has become a judge of the law. In other words, judging something where God has given a believer an area of freedom, of preference. Sometimes this is expressed in uh, the church by way of worship styles. Some of us like the more traditional worship styles because we were brought up in that where we sang hymns. And those of you who remember back that far, remember we actually had this thing called a book, a Baptist hymnal. And it was normally in the very back part of the pew, right? And we sang hymns. There may have been a piano, may have been an organ, anything more than that. We're bordering on dangerous ground. <laughs> and that was the worship style we grew up with. Now, you take someone like that, particularly if they come from a small community, maybe in East Texas or Louisiana, and you bring them into a worship service where there's lights and smoke and there's rock bands or what appears or what they would call a rock band. It's not really a rock band, but it's instruments. It's bass guitar, right? Electric guitars. You have drums. You have an orchestra. And all of a sudden, they begin to play that music and they're singing songs that can be nowhere found in a Baptist hymnal. And you begin to say within yourself, that's not right. That's not right. And then you begin to tell the person sitting next to you, that's not right. That can spread pretty quick. You say, oh, come on. Let me tell you something. Churches have divided over that issue. 
They've divided over that issue. And it's really a matter of preference. Making a joyful noise to the Lord. Look at what Jesus said about something like this. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. Now he's not saying don't judge or make an assessment regarding something that is truly sinful. That is, that something that violates God's moral command. He says, For in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? Behold, you have a log in your eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Give people the freedom to be who they are in Christ, as long as it doesn't violate God's moral issue. God doesn't care what kind of music they listen to. He doesn't care what they wear. He doesn't care what they drive. He doesn't care where they live. He doesn't care where they work. So don't put a burden on the back of your brother or sister in Christ because you have a preference that's different from theirs. The bottom line is this. MacArthur notes, The greatest sermon teaches that Christians are to be discerning and perceptive in what they believe and in what they do, that they must make every effort to judge between truth and falsehood, between the internal and the external, between the reality and the sham, between true righteousness and false righteousness, in short, between God's ways and all other ways. And it's something that you say, well, yeah, I mean, that's rather intuitive for the Christian. Really, do we do it? When we wake up in the morning, is that in our mind? When we leave the house and start to get into traffic, is that on your mind? When the guy drives by that you've cut off and he gives you the universal unapproved symbol? What about when you get to work and you begin to deal with your boss or your co-workers? Is this on your mind? When you get home and you deal with your spouse, is this on your mind? When you deal with your kids, is this on your mind? It's not that easy. You have to put forth a lot of effort to reflect upon God's Word, to ponder as it relates to the everyday issues of life and the moment-by-moment -moment decisions that we are making. But it's what God expects us to do. The Holy Spirit, we have to yield to Him in reference to when we do these things. If we don't, then obviously we're going to make fleshly decisions. Uh, so that's the great question that we say, well, how do we live our lives then? By exactly what Paul says, walk according to the Spirit. That is how you arrange and order your life, Galatians 5.22. You'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so how we express that in terms of our behavior demonstrates whether in fact we are walking by the Spirit or we're walking by our own flesh. So worldly mindedness then expresses itself in seeking self-gratification, being critical of other people, and then finally living your life with an arrogant disregard of God's purposes. And we see that in verses 13 through 17. What James is telling us and going to tell us is that we should live our lives oriented around God's plan, that is, His Word as revealed through His plan. Look at what he says. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. It's not a bad plan. But notice, James says, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. The point that he's making is this. Don't boast in what you are planning and what you are going to do in the sense that you're the ultimate designer of your life. We, we can't live that way. The scriptures affirm that we can't live that way. The writer of the Proverbs 27 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. That's true. As a matter of fact, at the last commencement of the Master's Seminary, 
there was a gentleman in there, I was told by um, one of the faculty members at the school, who, uh, you know, they, they say if they start off with the master's degrees and then they go to the THMs and PhDs and doctorate of ministry degrees and so on, uh, and so they were getting down to the end. There was a gentleman who, after completing his studies, walked across, shook Dr. MacArthur's hand, was given a diploma. He stepped over to the next guy who uh, was uh, one of the, either the vice president of the school or a faculty member who put the hood on him. If you get a hood when you get your doctorate degree, you know, you snap a picture. He walked down the steps and was walking back to his seat when he collapsed and passed away right there. So he got promoted to heaven immediately. But we don't know what life is going to hold. We don't know what's going to happen 30 minutes from now. When you leave here, whether today is going to be the first of many more days to come for you or could potentially be your last, we should live and try to live and orient ourselves to God's plan. Meaning, we have to be sensitive to God's will. We see that in verse 15. This is what God desires and purposes for your life. In terms of will, that's what we mean and what James means when he writes this. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. Now the word there comes from the Greek word thelo, which means to purpose or desire something. One of the things that we need to keep in mind whenever you come across God's will in Scripture that we need to understand that there are various facets of God's will. There's God's decreed will, that is what God has ultimately purposed and planned. Then there's God's moral will, that which He uh, gives to us by way of the written word, the Bible, that instructs us on how we should live, how we should think, how we should speak, and how we should relate to each other. That's God's moral will. And then there's another facet of God's will, which is referred to as God's will of disposition. That is, those things that God would desire for us to do, but those things that we are free not to do if we choose not to. And all of that is governed by what we might call God's providence. God's providence. R.C. Sproul puts it this way, he said, The central point of the doctrine of providence is the stress on God's government of the universe. He rules His creation with absolute sovereignty and authority. He governs everything that comes to pass from the greatest to the least. Therefore, it would be that when we make our plans, we always have to keep in mind in reference to God's perfect sovereign plan. Which, by the way, we cannot know in advance until it happens. I remember when Jim Adams was alive, he wanted to go to Africa. There's one big mission trip to go there. And he said, I want to go. Do you think it's God's will that I go? I said, I don't know, Jim. And so he ended up going. Stayed there for a while had some great photographs, did some great ministry while he was there, and then he came back to the class and he said, do you believe it was God's will that I went to Africa now? And I said, yes, but without a, any degree of, of doubt, I believe that is God's will. He said, well, how can you say that now? I said, because you went. Because you went there. You see, we can't know God's plan in terms of His ultimate will until after it happens, except for a couple of things that are revealed to us by way of Scripture. One of those things is prophecy. That is, we can know certain facets about what God has included in His plan because He has given us that information by way of prophecy, which is a quarter of the Scriptures. We know, for example, without a doubt, that one of these days the Lord is going to return for the church. John chapter 14 makes that clear. Paul writes over in Thessalonians that the Lord is going to come with a trumpet, that with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and will always be together with the Lord from that point forward. 
We know that during that time period, when that happens, at some point after that, there's going to rise a man of sin who will make a peace accord with the nation of Israel, which will fulfill Daniel's 70th week when all of that is transpiring on the earth, at which time we will be in heaven receiving the scrutiny and the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ in terms of our position, rewards, and inheritance. We've talked about the Bema of Christ at some length in the past, but that's what we'll be doing in that preparatory time. And then in Revelation chapter 19, we are rewarded. We have been bestowed our inheritance, our rewards, our crowns, and so forth in terms of that which God is going to give us to wear. And the reason we know that is because it tells us that the armies in heaven following the Lord in His return, which include the church, they are wearing white linen, fine and clean. We know He's going to come back. We know He's going to set up His millennial kingdom upon the earth. When He comes back, He's not going to go to the ACLU and ask for permission to set up His kingdom. He's not going to go to the United Nations and seek approval to set up His temple at the top of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Every knee will ultimately bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Regardless of what any human, any institution, any country says currently about Him and His plan. Amen. Glory. So that's another facet of God's will that we can't know until after it happens except what we can know by way of prophecy. And then secondly, we can know the eternal destiny of the saved and the lost. Meaning, ultimately, everyone's going somewhere. Atheists like to think that they get all dressed up to die and they just go into the ground and that's it. Game over. That is not the case. Jesus, Jesus made it very clear in His story about the rich man and Lazarus that there is ultimately a place where we go immaterially. That is, our spirits go to await the great day of judgment. Those who die in their sins go to a place of torment. Those who are trusting, that is, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, go with Him to paradise. That's why Jesus could tell the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. But apart from those two things, that is, the things given to us by way of prophecy and the things that are given to us by way of the ultimate destiny of the saved and the lost, we can't know anything else that's going to happen in the future five minutes from now until after it happens. So some facet of what James is referring to has that in mind in reference to God's will, that is, His ultimate sovereign plan. And the thing we also need to keep in mind with that in terms of God's providential control over it is that He is the one who ultimately keeps and sustains your life. By that, what we mean is that He either causes or permits every action by directing whatsoever comes to pass through primary or secondary causes. You say, well, that sounds an awful lot like philosophy. What does that mean? It means that God either directly causes, that is, He steps in time to personally cause something to happen, or He directs through secondary causes, that is, He causes something to happen through the responses, decisions, and actions of other people. Job is a perfect example of that. Whenever we think about suffering in the Bible, one can go no further, really, than the man Job. We know that it was Satan who comes to God. God says, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, certainly. You put a hedge of protection around him. You bless him at every, every day. But if you stop that, you take the hedge of protection away from him, he'll curse you to your face. So God says, all that he has is in your hand. Just don't kill him. So what does Satan do? Satan goes out. He actually controls the weather which causes devastation to Job's flock and Job's children ends up taking their life and then his stuff gets stolen by the Chaldeans who come down and take away his stuff. Now we might say that God is the ultimate cause, meaning God is the one who is causing uh, ultimately all of these things, but in terms of the blameworthy cause, it is Satan who's doing these things and it's the human instrument, the Chaldeans, who come in and they murder and steal Job's stuff. So that's what we mean when we say secondary causes. 
The thing we need to remember is that either through primary or secondary causes, He is directing all things to fulfill His purposes in our life. And those things are good. As we've been studying about in reference to the goat, the greatest chapter of all times, many people think, Romans chapter 8, that He causes all things to work together for the good. That is, to those who love God, to those who have been called according to His purposes. The one thing that we can take great comfort in knowing is this, is that God can hit a home run with a crooked bat every time. So He can take even my bad choices and work them out to the good. You say, how can God do that? Because He's God. Now, look at what James is saying here. He said, if the Lord wills, again... I've jumped the gun a little bit by talking a little bit about primary, secondary causes and all these things. But fundamentally, what James is referring to when he says, if the Lord wills, that is what the Lord may desire for us as we carry out His moral will, what God has determined in an ultimate sense, or what God has decreed in His sovereign plan or decreed will. So this is the way we need to understand the way James is using it. He uses the term, with the Greek word there for will, as thelo, and it means to desire, to wish, or to choose. It is God's desire, it is God's wish, or uh, you know, his, his will of disposition that we do not sin. That's what God desires for us, that none of us sin. But ultimately we know that we can do that. That's a different way that it, the word is used in terms of will than that of decree. Decree which is also mentioned in Scripture. I'll show you a verse or two here in a moment. Uh, this is different from what God desires in that this has the stamp of governmental or what we might call sovereign authority. It is to purpose, to direct, or to cause. This is what God has immutably planned. So let's look at a couple of verses where we talk about God's desire, His thelo. Uh, in Acts chapter 18, Paul is leaving the uh, Ephesian elders. He said, when they asked him to stay for a long time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, this is what he tells them, I will return to you again if God wills, as he set sail from Ephesus. So what he's saying here is, in reference to the desire, if it's God's desire that I come back, then I'll come back. Just like when Jim asked me, do you think it's God's will that I go to Africa? Well, if it's God's will that you go, you'll go, and you'll come back. And he did. But that's something you can't know until after it happens. 1 Corinthians 4. But I will come to you soon, Paul writes, if the Lord wills, that is, if it is the Lord's good pleasure, that is, if it's His desire. And then in 1 Timothy 2, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires the repentance and faith of every person. That is, that's something that He desires. Now, the word boule, the noun, and the word bulamai, uh, the verb, when God is the subject in Scripture, when these words are used, when God is the subject, it expresses His counsel, His purpose, His determination, His will or decree, that is, that which cannot be changed. That's God's eternal plan. For example, in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew writes, this is Jesus speaking, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal to Him. That's Christ sovereignly revealing Himself to, to the people. That's what that means. It's, there's no chance that it can't happen. 1 Corinthians 12, But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually, just as He wills, determines, purposes. Here He's talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit dispenses spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit dispenses spiritual gifts to every 
believer. Not every believer has every gift, but every believer has a gift by which the Holy Spirit sovereignly gives him or her. So don't miss James's point, because his point is simply this. It should be noted that James finds nothing wrong with planning. One element in the prescribed conduct is to be able to say, we will do this or that. Absence of a plan is no virtue. What is faulty, however, is the sort of planning that fails to touch all the bases. That is, leaving God outside the picture is the grievous error. That's what he's saying. It's okay to plan, but make sure that we don't remove God from the planning process, that we take into account that any change made in the plan might be by God's sovereign control and or direction, and that we accept that humbly from His hand. Which means what? We have to be sensitive to God's timing. Verse 16. He says, But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. What's he referring to? He's referring to, Hey, come now, we'll go spend a year in this city, we'll make a bunch of money, and we'll come back. That, he's saying that kind of attitude is arrogance. The word boast here, kalkeomai, means to boast, to glory, or to take pride in oneself in something. It can be used as a positive or negative meaning. The context will determine whether it's good or bad. For example, an acceptable use of this word would be that believers, if we are to boast, are to what? Boast only in the Lord. However, James says that boasting in one's own accomplishments, we'll go to such and such city, spend a year, and make a lot of money. Boasting in one's own accomplishments and plans without giving any thought to God and His provision is sin. That's why he says all such boasting like that is evil. So to him who knows to do the right thing and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Notice what uh, Dr. Hodges notes. He says, If they knew that they should acknowledge their dependence on God's will, then speaking about their plans, they should start at once to act on that knowledge. Sin, therefore, can occur not merely as a wrong act, but also as a right act which remains undone. Accordingly, we dare not omit from our conversation the recognition that not only our lives but all of our activities are as fragile as a wisp of smoke. We must acknowledge that God alone can enable us to do whatever we hope or plan to do, so that we live our lives with this understanding, that we can make our plans, but it is the Lord who determines our steps. One man that found that out was Abraham Lincoln, probably one of the greatest presidents of the United States. When he was a younger man, he was an entrepreneur to some degree in that he had a little country store with another gentleman he owned by the name of Barry. They weren't doing very well financially. Barry asked Lincoln, he said, how much longer can we keep this going? Lincoln said, well, it looks as if our business is just about winked out. As he was talking, he says, you know, I wouldn't mind so much if I could just do what I really wanted to do. I want to study law, Lincoln said. I wouldn't mind so much if we could sell everything, everything that we've got, and just pay all of our bills and have just enough money left over for me to buy one book. Blackstone's Commentary on English Law, but I guess I can't. About that time, as Barry and Lincoln were talking on the front porch of this little store, a covered wagon came down the road. The man pulled up and said, Me and my family are moving out west, and I'm completely out of money. Would you gentlemen be interested in buying a barrel? It's a good barrel, and I'll sell it to you for only 50 cents. Lincoln walked over to look at the barrel, and as he was looking at the barrel, he noticed the man's wife and kids in the back of the wagon emaciated because they had been struggling, and he knew it. He thought for a moment, 
He pulled his last 50 cents out of his pocket and said, Sure, why not? I reckon I could always use a good barrel. So the barrel stood on the porch of that little country store all day with Barry, Lincoln's partner, chiding him about what appeared to be an unwise business venture. Finally, Lincoln had had enough and he walked over to the barrel and he put his long arm down in the barrel and felt something hard. He pulled the contents up out of the barrel and then he stood there petrified. It was Blackstone's commentary on English law. Lincoln later wrote, I stood there holding the book and looking up toward the heavens, there came a deep impression on me that God had something for me to do and that he was now showing me that I had to get ready to do it. Why this miracle otherwise? So, as we leave today, let us consider a few things. First, to avoid conflicts in relationships, be willing to yield your personal preferences and desires to the desires and preferences of other people and non-moral issues. Does it really always have to be your way? Secondly, avoid judging other people according to your own preferences Allow them the freedom to be who they are in their own pursuit of the Christian life. Third, as we live our lives, we must do so with the realization that we are living within the sovereign will of God. Some things that we desire and plan to do, God is going to allow us to do that. Other things that we plan to do will not be permitted. And so we need to realize that that is a reality of living in this life for the moment. And then finally, we must accept by faith that God's plan is perfect because He is perfect. And that we are to trust that God is working all things according to the counsel of His own will for our good and His glory as He brings about His most glorious kingdom.